All right, Marta, let's 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 do it. I'm sure, but we're going to run out of time at the end with questions. So let's just, if you want to kick it off, yeah, and, um, kick it. people who missed the beginning can watch the recording. Okay, then uh, again, we are excited to continue the SRF webinar series. The goals of the series is getting you closer to the science, making you aware of the research that is being done and the opportunities to participate and empower you on uh, communications with clinicians. We also want to give you a plug to our next webinar that will take place on August 20 at 10 Pacific time. Uh, it will be with Dr. Elise Brimble uh, on leveraging technology to improve access to rare disease research. And today our speaker is Dr. Tonya Smith-Hicks. She is an assistant professor of neurology at John Hopkins University School of Medicine. She's also the medical director for the Center of, for Autism and Related D Disorders and the director of basic science research in fragile X syndrome at the Kennedy Trigger Institute. She earned her PhD MD at Columbia University College. Then she trained in pediatrics at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. She completed her training in child neurologist and neuroscience at the John Hopkins and uh, she stay as a faculty there. In addition to seeing a patients, Dr. Smith sees patients in variety of uh, neurodevelopmental disorders in her clinic as a co-director of Fragile X, SYNGAP, and Red Syndrome clinical programs. A translational program that she runs focuses on exploring EEG-based biomarkers and virtual technologies to evaluate gait, behavior, and cognition. Her research lab is focused on understanding the faulty communications between neurons, which lead to deficit seen in neurodevelopmental disorders using a variety of techniques. Dr. Hicks is very accomplished, yet she is still extremely compassionate, enthusiastic, and very kind. We are grateful for the work that she's doing and her interest in developing biomarkers for SYNGAP. After this introduction, I want to remind you that uh, this webinar will be available in the SRF website. We are uh, recording the webinar. And if you have any questions, please use the chat and uh, they will be answered by the end of the, uh, meeting, the conference. And welcome, Dr. Hicks. Now it's your turn to talk. Thank you. Thank you, Martha, for that warm introduction. Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be able to connect with you all, albeit uh, via camera. Um, my talk today will be focused on biomarker development, which is a critical step in the path towards uh, clinical trial readiness. So I'll break up my talk into four parts. Um, first, I'll address the question, what are biomarkers and why are they important? And after that, I'll uh, give some examples of biomarkers that are currently being developed in other rare dis uh, genetic disorders that are similar to SYNGAP. Um, then I'll talk about biomarker development in SYNGAP in specific. And uh, finally, uh, where we are in the process uh, towards development that is from discovery uh, to the clinical trials. Now, a consensus statement was put out by the FDA and it essentially states that biomarkers are biological observations. They substitute for or they predict clinically relevant endpoints or intermediate outcomes. Biomarkers must be indicators of normal biology or pathological processes and they should be measurable. That is, they should have a strong signal to noise ratio and be reliable indicators of change they should also have predictive value. Biomarkers can be used for diagnosis. They can be used to monitor response to treatments. They can be used to determine risk, that is disease progression or the likelihood of recurrence. They can be used for selection. And one way of doing that is to enable patient stratification. In addition, they can be used to predict therapeutic effect of an intervention. For the purposes of illustration, I'm going to use hypertension, a, a common disorder that is linked to high morbidity and mortality. That is, 
uh, hypertension often leads to chronic illness such as heart problems, kidney problems, and even death. Now, blood pressure measurements are a biomarker for hypertension. It can be used for diagnosis as well as to monitor response to treatment. However, it's less useful for determining risks, that is, disease progression. An echocardiogram of the heart or measurement of kidney function are better suited to determining risk. In the case of hypertension, selection biomarkers such as nitrate peptide can be used to stratify patients into risk categories. Ideal biomarkers are simple. The goal is that they're inexpensive surrogate endpoints and that they should ideally be able to be analyzed repeatedly over a short period of time. So again, if we go back to the uh, hypertension and we think of blood pressure measurements, those are easy to obtain, they uh, are repeatable, and when compared to getting an echo or uh, evaluating, evaluating uh, morbidity and mortality, uh, blood pressure readings are certainly um, the way to go. Now, how are biomarkers used in clinical trials? I think before I talk about that, I want to define the steps that are necessary for a drug or intervention to be approved for use by the FDA. There are four phases. Phase one is the experimental drug, is where the experimental drug or treatment is given to the patient population for the first time. It's generally given to a small group of individuals, and the primary goals are to evaluate safety and to identify side effects. Phase two is where the experimental intervention is given to a larger group to determine effectiveness and to further evaluate for safety. While the goal of phase three is to confirm effectiveness and to monitor side effects. Phase three can also be used to compare the effectiveness of the experimental treatment with standard of care or equivalent treatments. With each phase, you will notice that there is an increase both in the number of the participants and the duration of the study. Now, once the intervention is successful in phase three, the data from the clinical trial is filed with the FDA or other regulatory agencies before it is approved for use. So let's go back to the initial question, which is what's the utility of biomarkers in clinical trial? David Thomas and his colleagues performed this bioindustry analysis where they measured the success rates of investigational drugs as they transitioned from phase one to FDA approved status. They looked at about 10,000 clinical trials and 7,500 drug developmental programs. And they showed that when all diseases were pooled, the likelihood that an intervention would successfully move from phase one to approval is a little less than 10%. In the study, although about 63% of the interventional drugs passed the phase one, which is the safety state, only about 30% passed phase two, and so met criteria for both safety and being effective. Thus, what it tells us is that phase two is a critical state in uh, clinical, clinical trial research. When they parsed the data according to uh, organ systems, they noted that about 26% of um, blood-based disorders uh, had a likelihood of being approved when from phase one to uh, FDA approval. However, when, um, when we are looking at brain-based disorders, such as neurologic conditions or psychiatric condition, that approval rating uh, fell significantly to about 8% in brain-based in uh, neurologic disorders and 6% in psychiatric disorders. While this uh, change is uh, not surprising, it, there's some findings that they had that, which was um, particularly encouraging and that is that in the case of rare disorders uh, where a diagnostic biomarker is available, the likelihood that an intervention will successfully move from phase two to phase three is about two times um, greater likelihood when compared, when the rare disorder is compared uh, to the chronic disorder. And the likelihood for approval from phase one is about three times greater when a rare disorder is compared uh, with a chronic disorder. 
Bear in mind, however, that the, the increase that's uh, reported here uh, represents rare disorders in general, and it's not specific for brain-based disorders. Despite this, um, the increase here is uh, encouraging because it points to the importance of diagnostic biomarkers, which is what we have in the, in the case of SYNCAP1. So uh, this study indicates that uh, the rate limiting step lies at the phase two, three transition. And this is where effectiveness of the intervention is first studied. So the question is, well, how do we move the needle here? I would argue that the answer rests in these considerations that I posted here that I think applies to um, many uh, rare disorders. Uh, first, rare disorders are generally comprised of small populations of patients, hence the term rare. Um, and the, the patient population is often uh, highly heterogeneous. There's variability in the clinical presentation, there's variability in the rate of disease progression, and variability in the range of severity. If we take epilepsy in SYNGAP1, for example, about 86% of patients are reported to have epilepsy. But there's variability in the type of seizures, the responsiveness to medication, and the age of onset. So although we have a diagnostic marker where we can identify patients with SYNGAP1, we still need biomarkers that can help us stratify our patients into more homogeneous groups. The other uh, point here is that um, in rare diseases, the disorders are generally uh, poorly understood. And in the case of SYNGAP, although we know a lot about the science behind SYNGAP and we're still making progress towards understanding natural history of the disorder as it relates to the developmental progression and the emergence of disease phenotype, there is still much we don't know. Um, so we're, we're working actively towards increasing our knowledge base, and I think we're, we're making some good strides in that regard. There is, in the case of SENGAP, certainly um, limited specific drug development precedents, and there's uh, certainly lack of previous clinical trials experience. Um, but despite that, the important takeaway that I want to leave with you is that although our first clinical trial may not prove to be an effective treatment, we anticipate that the information that we learn from these experiences should be able to help us move, move the needle to more, towards a more successful outcome. And you know, we believe that um, this can be accomplished by development of additional biomarkers that can be used for stratification of the population and that will help us determine a more clinically meaningful change. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to uh, have us look at some biomarker development in other rare uh, genetic causes of neurodevelopmental uh, disorders. Now, there's been a lot of work in developmental biomarkers in autism in general, and certainly uh, genetic disorders that manifest with autism as a clinical phenotype. So here I'm showing some of the tools that are used for biomarker identification. So in the case of cognition, it can be measured using standardized uh, tools, psychometric um, measurements that are used to evaluate the language and IQ. And then eye tracking is um, uh, certainly an emerging technology that is being used to evaluate event memory, as well as um, emotion recognition, where uh, one infers the emotional state of an individual by their facial expression. Brain imaging is uh, commonly used to examine both structure and function. And it is also a useful tool in some rare disorders, for example, tuberous sclerosis, uh, where uh, structural lesions are commonplace. Um, you'll find that EEGs are certainly one of the most commonly used tools for identification of biomarkers. Um, some of the benefits in a, of an EEG is that they're non-invasive. They record the brain's electrical activity across the entire lifespan, and they can be used in individuals with varying degree of cognition or language. Uh, biochemistry and genomics, these are emerging tools that have the potential for being very powerful. Um, one of the nice things about them is that they use biological samples that are minimally invasive. Um, so for example, blood, saliva, or hair, so samples that are often used uh, in routine clinical care. Now, 
Um, I've said before that EEGs are commonly, the commonly used tools to identify biomarkers in NED, and the two disorders that I'm showing here, Angelman syndrome and tuberous sclerosis complex, uh, share common features with SYNGAP1, notably uh, intellectual disability, epilepsy, autism, and, and sleep. The genes involved in Angelman and TSC are very different from SYNGAP1 with regard to their function, but they're all expressed at the synapse. Now, you'll notice that both disorders, EEGs, were used as a tool to identify different biological signatures of clinically relevant issues. So in the case of um, uh, Angelman syndrome, several EEGs revealed increased delta power. Now, although delta, delta power is generally associated with sleep, the increase was noted in the awake states in both the Angelman syndrome mouse model and humans. Um, so the, the general thinking here is that uh, increased delta power may be a useful uh, biomarker in uh, Angelman syndrome. In addition, uh, serial EEGs uh, were used in TSC infants, and the, what they've shown here is that they have been able to identify uh, patients who are at the highest risk for developing epilepsy even before seizure onset. In patients with uh, Angelman syndrome, they used a quantitative analysis um, of the EEG during sleep. So they used uh, sleep EEGs, did a quantitative analysis of it, and reveal that reduction in both the sleep spindle number and the duration of the sleep spindle. Now, this difference is thought to reflect uh, sleep disturbances in Angelman syndrome. And in the case of tuberous sclerosis, they uh, evaluated EEG features in stage two sleep, and they found a suggestion that algorithm may be used to predict uh, the risk for developing autism. So where are we um, with biomarker development in SYNGAP1? So I just want to reiterate a few things. Um, so successful biomarkers should be linked to, to clinically meaningful outcomes. And ideally, they should provide comparable readouts between animal models and humans. And the value of that is that it makes translation of the therapeutic interventions that are identified in animal models more seamless. So in the case of seizures, abnormal spiking on the EEG that represents imbalance in inhibition and excitation has the potential as a useful biomarker. We see abnormal spiking both in our Syngap mouse models and certainly in our patients' EEGs. Um, work from Gavin Rombas lab showed a link between um, premature maturation of the synaptic sensory cortex um, and uh, sensory processing difference in the mouse model of SYNGAP1. And uh, EEGs in the form of event-related uh, potentials can be used to identify biomarkers that are related to the processing of sensory information. You may recall uh, Shilpa Kadam's lab uh, shared that uh, gamma power measured by EEG is linked to transition states in sleep and that this is dysregulated both in the, the mouse model of SYNCAP1 as well as the uh, patients. Now, interictal spikes that worsen in sleep is often seen in epilepsy syndrome with significant cognitive impairment. And this increase in the spiking activity has been reported by uh, Gavin's group and also is another um, potential uh, for biomarker. So these are things that uh, we and others can begin to explore in our patients with SYNCAP1 to have a better understanding of which of these uh, potential EEG signatures um, can be useful for biomarker um, development and validation. Now, I told you about eye tracking as a tool that's being used in other autism programs, and that's certainly a possibility uh, in uh, SYNCAP patients. Um, gait assessments uh, can certainly be used to evaluate uh, coordination difficulties, which is a common feature of, um, in, in, our, in our children with uh, SYNGAP1. So at the SYNGAP biomarker program at KKI, we have been using EEGs as one of our tools. Um, several weeks ago, Shilpa Kadam spoke about her work looking at gamma power and transition states. 
Um, one of the things that we have been doing is we've been evaluating event related potentials um, to study sensory profile in uh, patients with SYNGAP1. Now, event related potential is an EEG based uh, technology or technique, rather. Um, this approach, however, requires that the individual be present in the research lab and the pre existing clinical EEGs um, cannot be used for this aspect of our research. Um, this is actually you know, uh, true for the work that we've been doing in um, evaluating gates and the coordination. And initially we started this work by using electronic walkways and, and biosensors, the goal being to uh, use the electronic walkway, which is the gold standard, uh, to validate uh, the data from our biosensors. However, uh, given the current challenges imposed on us by the pandemic, we've had to modify our GATES uh, protocol, and now we're uh, beginning to uh, roll out a video-based um, program where we're gonna be using algorithms that will allow us to gather uh, data uh, remotely. Uh, we have also been evaluating sleep and behavior using actigraphy. Uh, some of you have already participated in this arm of the study. And um, one of the beauties of this uh, particular project is that it certainly allows us to um, acquire data remotely. And so it's, it's not something that is, has um, been significantly impacted um, by the pandemic. Um, Blood-based biomarker is another avenue that we have recently begun to explore. Um, and uh, it will certainly require uh, creativity to be able to get blood samples to us, but um, I, I have reason to believe that it, it should be doable. Some of you may ask, well, how can you use uh, blood-based biomarkers to identify, um, or, or blood rather, to identify biomarkers in, in brain-based disorders? And uh, certainly there are challenges um, with that approach, but we do know that metabolites in the brain are, um, can move from the brain to the blood via the blood-brain brain barrier. And it does this either via an active transport approach or a more passive uh, transport approach. Now, the concentrations of these um, molecules may certainly vary with uh, the circadian rhythm being either uh, lower in the sleep state than higher in the awake state. And one of the biggest challenges is the idea that um, these molecules are going to be found in highest concentration in the CSF. So we don't really want to um, go doing lumbar taps on our kids, but we expect that with the use of mass spectroscopy and other high throughput measures, we should be able to identify small numbers of the uh, molecules in the blood. So if we were successful, which I anticipate that we will have some definite successes based on uh, some of our preliminary data, but um, how will we envision using these biomarkers? Um, we've already uh, talked about the fact that in the Syngap population, we already have a diagnostic biomarker, which identify patients who have genetic changes. Um, so if we start with a group of individuals with changes in Syngap and say we start with those who have loss of function, there is, we can anticipate that there is still going to be some variability in the clinical phenotype. And so um, that population is going to be heterogeneous to some degree. It, applying these biomarkers and additional outcome measures um, to that population, we anticipate that we'll be able to divide the group into more homogeneous cohorts. And thus we move from a, a more heterogeneous um, cohort using stratification measures to more homogeneous cohorts. Now, another value of biomarker is that uh, it could be used for target engagement. So although we haven't proposed any uh, such, the uh, one can envision that if a drug were to bind to its target, that might be a, a consequent metabolite that could then be transported to the blood and be measured in the blood. Ideally, we hope to identify a surrogate endpoints with a high likelihood of being correlated with clinical benefits. And the, the value of that, that it will allow for rapid detection of clinical meaningful change even, even before that change is observed in the patient. 
And an example of that would be language, right? If there were an EEG signature that suggests um, that there's going to be improvement of, in language and we monitor that in a longitudinal way, then that EEG could be used in a clinical trial as a surrogate endpoint. So where are we in the process of biomarker development? I've shown you here this slide that I um, got uh, from uh, the NINS website, and it essentially shows the the trajectory for biomarker development. We start first with the discovery, the analytical, then we move on to clinical validation. Uh, the qualification uh, step is not uh, a requirement um, for all biomarkers, but it's, it's posted there. So for our ERP-based study, we are in the early validation steps. However, for our blood-based biomarker program, we are in the development steps. We expect that there is still more work to be done to complete um, the analytical validation, um, and that would require that we uh, repeat the uh, study in another uh, population to another group of individuals with SYNGAP1 before we can then take it um, to uh, a natural history study where we can evaluate um, its profile more in, with regard to its dynamic range. So, you know, we can look at individuals of varying ages, um, varying uh, clinical profiles, um, and begin to understand uh, the changes of that biomarker over time. Now, the, the last um, topic I want to talk touch briefly on is parent patient registries versus natural history studies. Now, a uh, patient registry is uh, a repository for clinical data. So it's really data that's acquired through routine clinical care is deposited in that registry. Um, it's collected in a standardized format. The data can be used to support natural history studies, and it can also be used to support recruitment for clinical trials. Patient registry is, however, different from a natural history study, and as the name implies, a natural history study is a research study that's designed to track the disease over time. It explores the disease in a comprehensive way. Um, one can use it to identify variables that correlate with the disease and its outcomes. Natural history studies uh, can be used to develop uh, best care practices, so things that uh, translate to clinical care of our patients, as well it can be used to develop biomarkers and outcome measures. And in addition, it can be used uh, for clinical trial recruitments, much in, like uh, patient registries. So with that, I want to acknowledge um, some of my collaborators at Kennedy Krieger, Josh Yuen, who runs the EEG labs, and uh, Griffin Broker, who has um, been uh, very um, helpful in the development of a vigor-based behavioral assay that um, we're uh, developing, but which I haven't talked about. Our funding has come from the IDDRC at Kennedy Krieger Hopkins and some from Bridge to the Gap Foundation. I want to thank the, thank the Parent Foundation, certainly SimGap Research Fund and Bridge the Gap. I mean, you know, these foundations, in, in terms of their longevity, they're relatively young, but they have made significant impact on and not just the SimGap community, but other rare disease uh, space. And certainly, most importantly, thanks to all the parents who have supported um, our research at uh, Kennedy Krieger Institute and, and other agents, agencies. So with that, I will take any questions that you may have. And I think I will stop sharing. Great. Thank you so much, Connie. Um, so we have a pretty intimate group. If people want to just jump in with their questions, March, I saw you type one, go for it. But, I, but since I'm already talking, I want to jump in. You said in passing, you have reason to believe that maybe we could find a biomarker in blood, which sounds kind of exciting. Like, can, we, can, we, can we coerce you into saying more? Because that <laughs> That's like the holy grail, right? I mean, that could lead to both diagnostic, diagnostic tools as well as ways to think about 
measuring progress in everything from small molecules to ASOs to other. Right. So I want to clarify that the, the biomarker is not uh, SYNGAP protein. Um, mm. So, you know, we, we have um, no real reason to believe it's SYNGAP protein, at least the isomer that is um, present in the brain is also present in the blood. But if we think about the, the uh, process of synaptic plasticity and all the, the uh, various changes in molecules that occur in the brain as the neurons are engaged in activity that allows us to, to speak and move and, and, uh, and you know, sleep in a, in a normal fashion, there are metabolites of those processes that then spill out into the, the CSF and consequently the brain. And uh, some of the things that we're looking at, we're certainly looking at some of those metabolites, we're looking at some proteins, and we're also looking at some lipids. Um, and I think that's where I'm gonna stop. But you have reason to believe that we could find stuff in the CSF that would tell us if a patient was increasing production of SYNGAP1 or no, or you don't wanna say. Um, so I, I don't know that we can find uh, something in the CSF that indicates that there is an increase in SYNGAP1. What I'm proposing is that we can find um, something, uh, a molecule that uh, gets spilled in the CSF that is then transported to the blood that gives us information on uh, synaptic mechanisms that are occurring in the brain. So not, not directly related to SYNGAP expression. Okay, bummer. Do you think that's possible to find? Well, if we don't look, we won't know. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I think the challenge, however, is going to be getting a CSF fluid requires a lumbar puncture, um, which is uh, an invasive procedure, especially if there is, if we cannot argue that we're doing it for, um, as part of routine clinical care. Um, so I think that there are challenges there. Is there, I'm gonna, I'll stop talking after this, I promise. But so as, as you certainly know, when our kids get sick, they get mm -hmm. sick. So when Tony got something last year, mm -hmm. he threw up, passed out, rushed to the ER, three days in, in, in something, and they did every test in the book. Like, it was ridiculous. So until the neurologist showed up and was like, he just gets sick, leave him alone. Um, it, was, it was the most ridiculous exchange. But as a part of doing every test in the book to this poor kid, they did do a lumbar puncture. Mm -hmm. And I was like, keep that fluid much like another time when he'd been in the ER and I'm like, no, don't take the leads off. I want the data. And both times the, the very well-meaning doctors looked at me and were like, this is not a research study, sir. Get out of my clinic. And I was like, well, if you're doing the lumbar puncture anyway, or if you've got the leads on him anyway, can we please have the data? Mm -hmm. How do we, how do we balance that as parents? Because on the one hand, you're right. I don't want to have my kids lumbar punctured on a regular basis. On the other hand, they're sick and they're getting subjected, subjected to is a little mm -hmm. provocative, but you get my point. There, there's a lot of procedures being done to them. So what's the most effective, appropriate, whatever way to capture that data or those samples so that we can explore these questions without subjecting these, these poor kids to more procedures? Um, so I think the best approach is to start with a pilot, right? So um, I, I don't really have a, a sense of how many individuals with SYNGAP do get lumbar punctures. But if we have five, that's a good number to start with. So if we can acquire um, that uh, CSF fluid that is frozen down uh, in some you know, labs, then that would be a good place to start. I mean, we certainly can get uh, CSF from um, individuals who, uh, you know, are undergoing uh, brain-based surgeries, um, and these might be otherwise neurotypical individuals or individuals who don't have a uh, SYNGAP1, um, and that could be used as control samples. So mm -hmm. there are ways to start with a pilot and see what we have as a consequence of that, and then uh, develop more appropriate um, measures. Um, when there is uh, a precedent, so uh, lumbar punctures uh, have been done, uh, have been performed in other rare disorders 
if we can indicate um, a, a specific significant rationale for subjecting our patients um, to that degree of an invasive test. So we can start with a, with a pilot and then decide how to proceed. Okay, thank you. I promised I'd stop talking. So Marta, over to you. Oh, um, my question was more related. If, uh, if there is any um, characteristic that you will say, this is very specific of finger patients that I normally don't hear in any other disease that you will like to use as a biomarker. So we, we do know, it, 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 when we think about um, characteristics in patients, we're thinking about uh, the clinical phenotype, and that is, falls more in the realm of uh, clinical outcome measures. Um, in a, based on my experience, and certainly from reviewing the, the literature, it, it would appear that all of our SYNGAP patients have some degree of sensory processing difficulties. So sensory processing um, could be evaluated both at the level of an outcome measure where it is often um, a questionnaire-based approach to studying as well as a biomarker uh, approach based to study. And that's something that we are looking as well. We're, we're looking at the outcome measure uh, side as well as the biomarker side. So I think uh, sensory processing is certainly something um, that is that we, we see being present in the majority of our patients with SYNGAP. A lot of times we associate sensory processing with autism spectrum disorder. But we know that not all of our Syngapians have autism, but they all seem to have sensory processing. So there seems to be um, a separation here and trying to better understand uh, um, what's driving what um, I think is, a, is an opportunity that we have to explore sensory from both an outcome measure perspective as well as a biomarker perspective. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. There was, um, last Friday, they, they did a um, presentation on uh, somebody who did analysis of a uh, patient with autism, and she was able to put six blocks of different uh, profiles on certain processing. I have to send you that. I have okay. the abstract. It was okay. very interesting, and that's, yeah. Wonderful. I think, you know, like, like autism, um, we see there's a lot of variability even in the cognitive profile of individuals with autism. So one of the things that we, we really want to do with SYNGAP, and we, we recognize that there is variability in the cognitive spectrum as well, but the idea, and this is something I didn't talk about, but something that we're working on as it relates to outcome measures, is that we're trying to identify um, psychometric tools that can be used across all individuals with SYNGAP, whether they are on the lower end of the spectrum or the higher functioning end of the spectrum. Um, and that's, that's something that I, I think we're making some progress towards, but I don't know that we truly have identified that yet. And you know, once we have narrowed it down, then we'll be uh, trying to recruit more individuals to validate it in a larger cohort. But there, there is definite variability both in ASD in general and uh, SYNGAP specific in other uh, rare disorders. Um, I have a quick question, just to follow up to that question mm -hmm. um, around you're just giving the, the example of sensory processing disorder. Mm -hmm. For something that has such high level of variability within the patients, how do you create kind of the baseline for that and measure against that? Okay. So there are, um, as it relates to outcome measurements, there are uh, standardized psychometric tools that can be used to evaluate sensory processing. And those um, look at really all the, uh, the sensory domains that an individual can have. Um, I think one of the ways that one could uh, use that to sort of uh, get standardized information for individuals with SYNGAP is to determine is the individual, um, is there a significant change and is a change in all domains? 
And how does that compare to say individuals with other genetic causes for their ID or their autism or autism in general? And that's one approach using outcome measures. Um, with biomarkers and, and uh, ERP, um, we're effectively looking at the brain's response to a stimulus. And that stimulus could be a vision stimulus, a tactile stim stimulus, an auditory stimulus. And the, the question is, can we identify signature, uh, signatures that are specific in our patients with SYNGAP1? And is the change also specific in our patients with SYNGAP1? Mm -hmm. The idea would be to start with those individuals or start with all comers, but maybe parse um, to look at those individuals with loss of function mutations separate from those with missense mutations and ask, is there a difference as we compare those two? And also as we compare syngaps with loss of function with another NDD or with autism in general. So biomarkers is really the way to get deeper and to be able to identify uh, features that are specific um, to SYNGAP and that one could potentially see in all individuals with SYNGAP, even though their clinical manifestation may be different. Thank you. That's interesting. I was thinking um, that it would be much more you know, subjective. One of the challenges with outcome measure as it relates to um, patient questionnaire is that there is a level of subjectivity that comes into it. And even if it's observation uh, by a clinician, there is a level of subjectivity that comes into it. And so I think that's why I've really focused the talk on biomarkers, because the goal here is that we're, we're using objective measures. And I, there's a caveat that even with the interpretation of what's a spike and, you know, what's the algorithm and that sort of thing, there is probably a little degree of subjectivity, but if you have just two individuals or four individuals um, making that call, then you can standardize and, and normalize their interpretation by coming up with algorithms that everybody agrees on. And so we can have a more streamlined approach to making the call, which I think uh, certainly informs and strengthens um, biomarkers. Thank you. So Neil, do you want to you want to say that out, out loud? <laughs> Connie, I want to just ask you one question, real quick. Mm -hmm. As a as a as a as a person who finds themselves talking to a newly diagnosed family every other week or so, mm -hmm. you you find yourself asking questions like, "How old's your kid? Have you seen seizures yet? Are they verbal?" And you're you're mentally bucketing these kids into sort of, I don't know if they're severity buckets or if you want to like tell the parent what to watch out for. And then you think about we're 600 that we know about in the world today and we're going to be much more soon. Is it, what, what's more likely that we find one thing that we can measure across this incredibly broad phenotypic spectrum or that Syngap1 becomes, develops sort of subsets of disease where we have kids like, you know, what I'm, you know what I'm trying to say? It, because it's just, it's sometimes the more I think about this and I talk and I look at my kid and I compare it to someone else's kid or I have com two radically different conversations with two different families about their patient. Mm -hmm. I, I just find myself wondering, is this really just one disease or is it multiple phenotypes that are presenting because of mutations on one gene? That might sound like an athema to a scientist, but do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> now, it, it makes a lot of sense. You know, um, one of the things I often tell parents is that um, the thing that your child has in common with the other Syngapian is that the, the genetic change is on the Syngap1 gene. Now, we have 20,000 genes, so 19,999 genes are different. And so that's why we all look different and we function different. And those genes, at least some of them, are impacting how Syngap would necessarily manifest in a neuron. So we are going to see uh, clinical variability. And I like to think of Syngap as um, that umbrella on which we hang speech disorder, delays in walking, epilepsy, ID, autism, sensory, right? And so I still think of it as 
one disorder because its etiology or its cause is the same, but with different clinical manifestations. And so to answer the question about biomarkers, I don't think that we're going to find one biomarker that will be sufficient for all syngapians. But I think that we have the opportunity to identify biomarkers that we could use to stratify and then perhaps even within those subclass. So you have a biomarker that you use to stratify those uh, with autism, for example, or those who have myoclonic epilepsy or atonic uh, epilepsy without the reflex seizures, right? And then there might be other biomarkers within that cohort that you can use um, to then uh, make uh, you know, additional uh, interpretations as to risk, as to improvement over time, that sort of thing. So that's that's my vision of uh, of things. I, I hope I hope that answered your question. It did. It's it's helpful to hear you hear how you're thinking. Um, hey, hey Dr. Ahead, Smith Hicks. Hi. Hi, this is Chung Ho Cha from Novartis, and it's nice to meet you over Zoom. I believe you've met some of my other colleagues, but uh, thank you, and and uh, that was really informative. But as and um, by the way, way back when I did a year at uh, Kennedy Krieger up in with Mike Johnston, so uh, it brings me back. Um, uh, you know, as as we think about potential therapeutics, I mean, and we we do have a gene target, which is which is great. In terms of clinically, what would you see in a patient that we treated with a therapeutic that would tell you, hey, we're really on the right track. This is really working. What, what would you pin, what would you think is like reliable? You know, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, when, when we think about the clinical phenotype of Sintaplon, right, we think of intellectual functioning, we think of epilepsy, we think of uh, disordered sleep, we think of autism, we think of sensory abnormalities. Um, and as I think about those clinical phenotypes, it, it, given the fact that we don't yet have a biomarker, if we were to do a clinical trial right now, right. what do we have that we could use to say um, we're on the right track? Right. Um, and and, I, I and by the way, as you list out those different things, it seems to me that some of those May or be may be more or less reversible or fixable. Is 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 that a fair assumption? Well, I I don't know that. I'm hopeful that uh, you know. Well, I guess the question is, what do you mean by reversible? Right? Do you mean complete normalization or do you mean comp improvement? And that may depend on you know the age of the individual. But I, I think that the answer to that question is still unknown. Um, our hope is that we can have interventions that will improve the functioning and consequently the quality of life of our patients. Um, but I, perhaps the, the point that um, you were alluding to, which I'd, I'd like to make, is that some of those clinical phenotypes are likely not going to look differently in the duration of a clinical trial. Right. You know, if they are six months long, four months long, the likelihood that we're going to see language development in a child with no language is probably small. So perhaps language should not be the outcome measure that we're using if we don't have a biomarker that could serve as a surrogate endpoint for language. Um, perhaps language shouldn't be that outcome measure that's included in the study. Perhaps something like sleep would be a more reasonable endpoint because we would anticipate that sleep um, is amenable to change in a shorter period of time. Um, you know, we treat our patients with uh, many uh, agents for sleep um, and we see improvement over time. So perhaps sleep would be a good target. Epilepsy, um, again, you know, we treat uh, patients with, epi with epilepsy with anti-EDs and we see improvement over time. So perhaps uh, epilepsy would be a, a good readout and there might be uh, biomarker signatures that could be used for that or potentially explored. In our SYNGAP population, sleep is a little bit tricky because um, many of them have uh, uh, absence, uh, atonic spells, 
reflex epilepsy. And so, you know, if, par if a parent is trying to count all of those, it becomes problematic, right? We may not have a good handle on truly how many seizures exist. So we, I, I believe that we need something more than just a seizure diary in order to help us answer the question about improvement in seizures. So I'm thinking based on where we are currently, I think sleep is a reasonable outcome measure. Uh, the seizures probably, but would, you know, we, we would need to have a be better approach to counting. Um, and see what are other things that uh, change in a reasonable uh, period of time. Uh, probably attention. I, I don't really have a good handle on the sensory piece um, just yet, but attention, sleep, and probably uh, seizures, I think would be reasonable things to, to try to uh, target. Thanks, that's helpful. Yeah, speaking for the parents, sleep would be God, if you can fix sleep. Um, and I would just say, if everything you just listed, Connie, was, was a clinical outcome, right? Um, but, and, and I realize there are some people, not you, but there are some clinicians who have told me point blank, they don't trust anything a parent said. Um, yeah, I know you know who I'm talking about. But, so what, if, you, what, if you got in the parent report, I mean, what about things like the ORCA scale? Just as an, an example, right? Because we know we, we were we were in, we were invited the other day to, to work with Duke on expanding the Orca scale and validating the Orca scale for things outside of Angelman. Mm -hmm. And is that would that cut it for a significant clinical trial, or would that just be a helpful data point as we strat? As, would that be more of a stratifying biomarker? So you know, not um, having participated in the use of the ORCA so far, I don't have a good handle on what the questions are and what the readout is. But I think uh, the ORCA has the potential for being a stratifying biomarker. Um, it's certainly reporting on its parent reporting of their observation. And uh, depending on how the questions are structured and how they're, they're weighted, uh, there might be some value there. You know, there are, there are studies that I participated in where uh, the Mullen scale of early learning was used to sort of evaluate language. Um, but what essentially happens, um, it wasn't used for the goal of stratifying. And so you had individuals who um, had more language than others. And so it made for an uneven playing field and baseline. So if an outcome measure could be used for stratification, then that votes well for improvement um, in be, being able to identify that the intervention is effective. So I, I think that there's some value there, even though I, I don't have a good sense of the details of it, but I think that there's some value there, um, at least um, in using it for stratification purposes. And I, I think it's a great opportunity. It's a great opportunity. I mean, they have, uh, as I understood it, um, have used it in Angelman syndrome. And so being able to ask the question, is this useful in other um, rare disorders? Um, I think that's going to have value for the whole community of uh, rare causes for NDD in specific. Yeah, we, we should talk more about that. I don't want to spend our last five minutes on the ORCA, although it is kind of cool. Um, I, I, if, if someone's been biting their tongue, I would jump in. Um, I see some of you are pretty active on the chat, so I'm just gonna throw some things out and maybe you can just react to them. We'll do a rapid round, um, Connie. Speech, so one person says, speech seems like something that can be measured fairly easily. Interesting, that, that actually is an orca thing. Other people, um, JJ, JJ is, is throwing out a list of things. She said muscle tone, EEG, sleep, but not all syngapping. She said, what about appetite or weight or growth? And then somebody else is saying, what would reaction time tests be useful? So let's, let's touch on the tone. So, you know, we, we can certainly evaluate tone uh, clinically, but it becomes challenging to quantify tone. We can say there's low tone, there's high tone, there's dystonia. But how do we quantify tone? We're really going to need to put our hands on uh, the patients um, in order to, to do that. Um, and I think tone will, will there be some challenges as it relates to 
um, quantifying tone. With regard to speech, um, so we can certainly say there is, you know, uh, one word or no word or word approximations. But when we think in the context of a clinical trial, we're, we're asking, is there a change in a three, four month period? And uh, the likelihood that language is gonna improve significantly, that, that it's measurable in that short interval of time is likely small. So yes, we evaluate language in the clinics, um, routinely, and we may do, you know, a, a year interval or something like that if we're doing a, a full assessment, um, but to be able to use that in clinical trial, it becomes challenging. So tone, language, uh, response, uh, response time. And I, I'm assuming that you're talking about throwing a ball or I'm not quite sure on what, what's meant with response time. Can someone clarify that so I can address it more appropriately? Yeah. Neil's locked away on mute. He doesn't want to clarify, I guess. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. Now um, I'm trying to do a school class while watching this at the same time. Sorry, Mike. Um, which one? Reaction time tests. Yes. Uh, so I'm wondering, I've seen a couple of cognitive tests on iPads mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. validated for reaction time. I don't know mm -hmm. if reaction time is a limitation within Syngap kids, but I just wondered if that I throw that in the mix. So um, we are... Uh, doing some um, NIH toolbox um, tests and others to evaluate uh, cognitive functioning. Um, and uh, what we have found is that uh, reaction time may be inputs, you know, a lot depends on the, the type of test, right? Does it require, um, uh, how much uh, receptive language does it require? And so reaction time can be a little tricky and a little sticky, but there are certainly other approaches uh, to being able to uh, evaluate um, some of the other cognitive components, whether it's working memory or, or uh, receptive language. Um, those are some of the, the things that I think are, are more amenable uh, to clinical trial research. Interesting, thank you. At least in our SYNGAP population, one of the things you're gonna, we have noticed is that there is variability in uh, genetic disorders in general, where we, there are some disorders where kids are, the, the majority of the kids are really low functioning. And so the idea is to identify tasks that works for them there, even though it might work for another uh, rare disorder where the kid um, is, uh, the majority of the kids are generally higher functioning and have um, uh, a higher base of receptive language or perhaps even some expressive language. Okay. Um, we're at the top, we're at the bottom of the hour, the top of the hour, whatever. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Smith Hicks, and for all the parents from Europe and the States and elsewhere who've joined in. If anyone's got one last question, Dr. Hicks is a very patient and kind person. She'll um, take it, but I, I want to also be respectful of time. So if anyone just can't sleep if they don't get something out right now, otherwise we will, we will say thank you. Mike, I have one quick question. Uh, Bonnie, thank you. Um, You're welcome. The, some of our kids have some severe aggression where they just kind of turn on a snap and I don't know if that's aggression is something that can be measured obviously it, a lot of it has to do with uh questioning the parents i guess you're not always going to see it clinically in the but and there are some that aren't you know i think my son is kind of in the middle and if he does snap it's pretty quick and he gets over it fairly quickly some kids it lasts forever. Is that something that can be measured or considered? So um, one of the things that we are doing is we're uh, using um, a tele-research video-based approach to evaluating um, problem behaviors in general in our Singapians um, with the idea of uh, trying, to, trying to determine if there are specific signatures um, that we see that uh, is present across uh, all Syngapians. And so we're in the process of exploring um, whether it's aggressive behaviors or self-injurious behaviors or 
um, you know, attention seeking behaviors or, or elopement. So we're, we're exploring those things. So hopefully we'll get to a place where we can say, yes, we have uh, a way of measuring it and we have a way of being able to uh, elicit the behavior in a consistent manner so there can be consistency across um, all the individuals. Okay, thank so you. So we're, we're hopeful. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. I think uh, Mike just had to jump off. He had another call that, that butted up to this one. Mm -hmm. um, I do see another question in the chat here from Robert. Robert, do you want to take yourself off mute and ask your question? Uh, sure. Uh, I hope I'm uh, uh, clear to hear. You are. Okay. Um, if the uh, biomarkers are uh, clear uh, of yeah, uh, what proportion it is, um, does a new uh, Zingapian knows what to expect in the future? So, I think, it, yeah, I think the question was basically if there are clear biomarkers, uh -huh. um, will a newly diagnosed Syngap patient right. have a better understanding of what to expect? Yes, and that's a great question because what it, you know, for a biomarker to be validated, part of it requires that um, it is uh, examined in a natural history study. And uh, in a natural history study, so uh, where we look at um, patients' uh, performance and clinical phenotype over time, that will give us a better understanding of what the long-term trajectory is like. And so in answer to your question, yes, if we have clear biomarkers that can be used to monitor uh, disease over time and disease change over time, then we'll be able to use that to provide uh, clinically meaningful and relevant information in care. And we can tell you, you know, patient X based on Y, we would expect Z. The caveat being that uh, every individual is different to some degree, even though they share that Syngap change, because there are many other genes that we have that uh, influence um, how our, our brains function. And so while it will give us um, good insight into what is likely to occur, it's not a crystal ball, so we cannot say that definitively this will occur. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, that's great. Um, any other questions? I think that is all of the questions that we have in the chat. Are there any other questions that anybody would like to jump in with here before we adjourn? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much again, Dr. Smith Hicks. We really appreciate your time today. Um, we will make this recording available under the webinar section on the SRF website. So you should find that in the next couple of days. Um, and if there are any um, follow-up questions for Dr. Smith Hicks, we're, we're happy to send those over to her as well. Uh, but again, I appreciate your time. Um, thank you so much. And we will be in touch with you here soon. It was my pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Bye Thanks, now. Bye-bye.